Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Basavraj Sopanavar from Toshiba America Research. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Uh, we'll be talking about GridDB. Uh, it's a purpose-built NoSQL database for the Internet of Things use cases. Uh, I'm pretty much excited to talk about this topic uh, because it's a great product used by a lot of uh, customers from Toshiba. Um, yeah, let's go. So, uh, by the way, a couple of housekeeping um, notes. Uh, ask as many questions uh, as much as possible you want. Even if I don't have time to answer them right now, uh, I'll be getting back to you uh, offline as well. So feel free. And this webinar will be available on demand for viewing for a later time. So if you miss uh, anything or any part, uh, or if you want to refer back to any of my slides, uh, so you can always uh, watch it on Bright Talk channel. All right, let's get started. Thanks again, and I appreciate uh, you joining me in this webinar. Uh, We have a little bit technical issue. Okay, all right. So I hope you can see uh, my slides here. This is the agenda for today. Uh, for people who are not familiar with IoT and databases, I'll be spending not more than two minutes uh, giving a brief introduction of what IoT and what databases uh, evolved from. And we'll be spending a lot of time on GridDB, which is uh, the uh, main topic for today. I'll be introducing what GridDB is. We'll uh, go through the feature set and its properties. Um, the interesting and the most exciting part of this presentation would be the real use cases of IoT and where GridDB has been used. And uh, I'll be planning to complete this by 40, 45 minutes so that we can have time for a quick demo and a Q&A at the end. All right. So these are the uh, numbers which have been um, in consistently talked about. Uh, the number of connected devices uh, by 2020, it will reach 50 billion. That's what Cisco says. We have IDZ's numbers and Gartner's number. And the IoT economics, so the revenue is projected, the IoT revenue would be around 300 billion to 470 billion mm -hmm. from Gartner and Bain. Uh, please bear with me. Uh, there is a little bit uh, sluggishness here. Um, so most the the point I'm trying to make here is uh, the number of connected devices are growing, and the revenue uh, that is being generated from IoT uh, is significantly growing. But the most important part here is you don't see IoT in home and you know smartphones. Uh, based on the Intel uh, infographics, and I think it's true. Most of the IoT uh, use cases you see are in the business and manufacturing, which is which we call the industrial IoT, and 30% of it is in the healthcare. So this is a technology stack of IoT, uh, which I prepared when I was researching of, uh, about IoT. I always try to go from bottom to top. So you have devices at the bottom, then the connectivity, it can be wired, wireless. And going above, you can see uh, there are a lot of different methods of communication. Then you have uh, different means in the section and communication layer. Uh, but the main part uh, is when we start dealing with the data. So data storage, data aggregation uh, comes in the bottom half, uh, or the top half. And GridDB is part uh, of this stack in the data storage and retrieval part, along with other uh, databases like MySQL and Cassandra. So finally, uh, the main idea is to get insights and improve on your uh, IoT use cases. So we have applications uh, dealing with uh, this data. They can be mobile application, web application, and business applications. So along with this, security and privacy is a main um, uh, important thing which we shouldn't be forgetting about. So it spans across all these layers, and that's pretty important. Same with the device and data management as well. As as things go online, uh, there is a risk of uh, them being secure, both the devices as well as data. Uh, 
So, um, just trying to understand what's your interest in in this webinar. Um, <clears throat> So you want to learn about quick, uh, learn about IoT in general, uh, listen about NoSQL databases, uh, what do you know, uh, you aren't interested in what the IoT databases can do, uh, or you have some um, IoT project planned in the near future. Uh, apparently the polls aren't working uh, right now. Let me try it again. Okay. So the polls are up. We start voting. Uh, I'll be uh, keeping this poll for another 50 seconds or so. Yeah, so you wanted to know about IoT in general, or you want to learn about MySQL database, or NoSQL database, sorry. Um, yeah, we see a lot of votes coming in. So you're planning or starting an IoT project in the near future. Mm -hmm. So you can so apparently uh, you can select only one. So choose the best option. All right, five more seconds and we'll move on. Thanks for your response. So uh, let's quickly deep dive into what IoT uh, data looks like. <clears throat> so as you know, IoT data mainly from the industrial use cases or even in the um, consumer use cases, they're all associated with this timestamp. And this is what, uh, this, this is just an example of uh, what an IoT data looks like. I've uh, picked up an example with voltage, current, and temperature along with a timestamp that is recording from a sensor, a couple of sensors uh, every 30 seconds. So one of the main properties is uh, it's a large volume but relatively small record size. If you see the record size, a single record uh, is less than 100 bytes. But you see a lot of millions of records. So if you record all these in every 30 seconds, so you end up getting millions of records within a month itself. So these are mainly structured. So people talk about big data, semi-structured, unstructured, but IoT data, if you start working on it, you fairly recognize it's pretty structured. And it's periodic, like uh, you tell the sensors or uh, the devices to send data periodically, or you query periodically, or there can be some sporadic events as well. So time stamped. So this is the most important part of the IoT data. So this, I would say, is um, a main uh, criteria when it comes to database. Uh, so that brings me to the next topic. What are the database requirements for IoT? Um, so I, IoT data is pretty different from your employees uh, or the general data that the traditional relational database model uh, created. So most of the uh, data IoT generates requires a special handling. So what are the database requirements for IoT? Um, it's high, the database should be highly available and fault tolerant, meaning uh, the database should be available no matter what, even if a node goes down, uh, it should be able to read and write. Even the values are a little bit older, that, that comes to the eventual consistency part. So, and it should be fault tolerant. The system should be up and running all the time. So it should be great for uh, millions of uh, read and write performance. So we, we would like to see this because we are not dealing with the size of a single record, but we are dealing with millions of records. So read and write performance is a must. So it should offer time series data and operation support. So if you have a couple of functions uh, in a database that supports time series operations, or if you have a lot of uh, data with time series, um, uh, timestamps with the data in these records, so your database should uh, be able to provide functions where you can manipulate data or query data based on these time series um, records. So it should offer fast search and range queries because you're querying uh, billions of records here, so that's a must. 
and it should offer spatial and geolocation support because we are dealing with uh, IoT in motion. That's a new concept that's coming up for fleet management and tracking. So if your da database supports geolocation and spatial data and some operations on top of it, that would be really great. So real-time support as well, real-time streaming support. So most of the uh, incoming data can be streamlined. It depends on your data pipeline, how your enterprise data pipeline looks like. But the most important factor of the IoT uh, database is it should support ever-increasing data. Meaning, so if you can see, there is a difference between scale up and scale out. If you can predict, okay, this is my IoT data for the next three years, then you can simply use uh, a fixed database, um, like a traditional uh, uh, RDBMS, which doesn't scale out. You can just scale up. So this, so you can start off small with three node cluster, five node cluster, as your data increases, Without stopping your system, you can just keep adding additional number of nodes. When I say nodes, it can be server, memory, um, or just the capacity itself. So these are the main uh, requirements of IoT data or database. So I found this on the internet. Uh, this is a pretty good uh, slide. I would say these are the, um, uh, the path where the database management systems uh, came across. So in the early 90s, uh, RDBMS, the traditional relational database model, the tabular model, was pretty famous. Then people realized there need to be um, a differentiation between the transactional databases, which can be operational, which is operational like banking, your retail, but and also there is a need for data warehousing where you have a huge data stored in your data lake and you want to perform BI and analytics on top of it. There you have OLAP and DWS. And today we see a new breed of DBs uh, starting from 2010, um, like key value stores, column stores, um, document stores, and graph stores. So um, I have uh, examples of all these on the right-hand side. Um, and we have Hadoop and data warehouses uh, at the bottom for batch analytics or um, uh, big data like analytics. So. Uh, just a quick, this is the last poll. Uh, I won't ask you for more. Um, your experience working with databases. So the voting is, the poll is up. You can start uh, pulling in the votes. So have you used relational uh, databases such as MySQL, Oracle, or Postgres? Worked with NoSQL databases such as MongoDB, Cassandra? Experienced with SQL as well as NoSQL databases. Never or rarely used any database. That's fine too. So you can see the poll at the bottom. So click the one that your best option is. Yeah, it looks like most people have used uh, traditional RDBMS uh, systems. And that's great to know. Yeah, no wonder option two is low because uh, people who have used NoSQL would have had some experience with RDBMS as well. So we, a lot, we see a lot of responses for option three. Uh, while you keep voting, I'll keep moving forward uh, in the sake of time. That brings me to our uh, topic, what is GridDB? Uh, GridDB is a database that was developed in-house in Toshiba back in 2011, and uh, we have been uh, using this for our customer solutions ever uh, since 2013. So it was in-house and used uh, by our uh, individual customers. But now uh, it's been open, and it's open source to public as well. So it's a highly scalable, it's an in-memory database, uh, it's a distributed one, meaning you can scale out. Uh, the data is distributed, and it's a key value store. The data model is a key value store, and it's mainly used for IoT. So you can check. Uh, the source code is available on open source. You can download it, start installing GridDB. So quickly deep diving into what GridDB is. Uh, it's a highly scalable um, database for Internet of Things use cases. So let's start at the bottom. These are all the real use cases that have uh, that our customers have been uh, using to, uh, with the GridDB deployed on their production systems. So if you see from the bottom, you have smart meters, 
photovoltaic, uh, photovoltaic systems, uh, pardon me, uh, remote terminals, sensors, monitors. Uh, so these generate data and the data is collected in the grid DB system. And the application on top uh, where the electric power system applications, building energy management systems, home energy management systems, they all um, make use of the data that is stored in GridDB. So these are all the real use cases here. But I'll go through the use cases once uh, in a couple of more minutes. So it's a highly distributed key container database. When I say this, so the, it's, it's very pictorial. So you can see on the left-hand side, you have data coming in from the sensors and devices, um, maybe along with the timestamp. Uh, time so you can also store data that doesn't have a timestamp as well. So, but I'm focusing here on the IoT use cases. So uh, the key container model, the time series data model, of, uh, I'll talk about this uh, in the next few slides. So that is for ingesting data onto your data store. Then you have uh, the TQL interface for querying data, just like RDBMS systems have uh, SQL interface, we have something called as TQL, the name uh, vaguely translates to Toshiba query language. Uh, so um, that is for querying data from the system. And as your data grows, you can keep adding uh, nodes that can be commodity hardware. You don't have to stick to a particular vendor's hardware to grow your data. So this is the overall picture of um, uh, the distributed grid DB system. So these are some of the NoSQL data models uh, uh, apparently uh, in town right now. So we have the simple key value store. Uh, React is one of the great examples of a key value store. You have a simple key and a value you store, it's distributed. Then you have column oriented, Cassandra white column I would say. White column was, uh, database model, uh, Cassandra is a big example, Google Big Table, another one. Then you have document models like uh, MongoDB and Couchbase. So finally we have something called as a key container model. Uh, this, is a, this is a fixed schema model and this is offered by GridDB. So you can visualize this as a key uh, to a particular table. So a, a container can be visualized as an individual uh, RDB table. So relational database table. So people who have worked with RDBMS um, would be really uh, familiar with this and they pretty much know exactly uh, how to code on GridDB. So it would be a very easy transition for them. So GridDB has a unique key container model, data model. I'll go through what a key container data model is. So container, again, like I told, it's a table in an RDB. Then we have a fixed schema. So when I say fixed schema, um, so this has a lot of advantages as well. So key container data model. So this word container uh, need not to be confused with um, the containers or uh, virtualization like Kubernetes or Docker. Uh, this term was coined a few years ago when the container systems were not so popular. So this is a key container model. Container is a group of data set with a fixed schema. So you have uh, very similar to an RDB. And if you see the figure, use there are two types of containers. One is a collection container for any generic record management. It doesn't have to be associated with a timestamp or a time series. So then you have time series container, uh, which is on the right-hand side. So the first uh, uh, data uh, or the data column would be a time series or a timestamp. So what does key container data model provides? Uh, it can, so the biggest uh, drawback of NoSQL database system is they give up asset guarantees uh, because they are distributed. So GridDB, what it does is it provides data consistency and along with other uh, ACID asset uh, properties uh, within the container. So data is consistent within the container. Um, that's pretty much it. And Due to this, due to these conditions, the fixed schema and the data consistency, you're faster, the search is faster, and the data retrieval is pretty fast. And we have uh, something like TQL, like I told, it's a SQL-like query language for reading data from the container. So people ask questions saying that why is the collection container used? So I'll give you a 
quick example. So you have like 100 uh, sensors in this room or in this building, I would say. So each sensor is sending data. So you store all these data in a time series container because it is associated with a timestamp. But you also need to maintain the records of all these uh, sensors. So you use a collection container with uh, equipment ID or a sensor ID as the main index or a primary index. So this is what uh, the flexibility grid DB provides. So I'll give you a quick example of what a key container data model looks like. So you can see smart meters in your homes uh, installed by your electric power company. So I'm yeah, sticking with that example. So it, let's say uh, it measures voltage, current, and temperature, even though the real uh, time uh, smart meters send uh, different data. So each smart sensor or smart meter from your home um, is uh, mapped to one uh, container. So this is an example. You define the schema here. Uh, it's, it's written in Java. So the schema is fixed for a particular type of equipment or a container or a sensor. So this measures uh, voltage, current, and temperature, and it comes with a timestamp. So this is a schema definition. And this is how you code it in Java. So you just say uh, you're creating a collection container. And this is the schema here and the container name. So you can create multiple uh, containers for, like, say, SM101 is the container from house number 101. So for house number 102, you can create another container for SM102. And you can say ts.put, and you can keep inserting all the records. So this is how a typical key container data model looks like. So GridDB offers high performance. When I say high performance, uh, there are many reasons why databases are uh, tuned to perform what they are uh, supposed to do. So GridDB is, uh, is a combination of in-memory and disk architecture. So what I say is some NoSQL databases are completely in-memory. The drawback with that is, say you're, you have a 7 GB RAM or 8 GB RAM, and your database size is more than that, of course. So you cannot uh, achieve that in a pure in-memory database. But GridDB has this option. So if your data size is 80 GB and your RAM is 8 GB, uh, the rest of the data is flushed onto the disk. Only the recently the most used um, data will be stored in memory, like the 8 GB. This works pretty much like a cache. So it's a combination of uh, in-memory and disk. So disk, when I say it's uh, SSD drives or hard disk drives. So this is a, on the left-hand side, you see the priority of how it goes, like CPU memory, cache memory, then the RAM, then the SSDs, and the disk. So this offers a really good performance uh, in terms of uh, GridDB is uh, concerned. So this is one of the ingenious uh, and data, the reasons why our customers are using GridDB in their systems. So. Just to uh, see how GridDB performed across um, uh, when compared to different NoSQL databases, there is a, a benchmark called YCSP. Uh, it's called Yahoo Cloud Servicing Benchmark. Most of you have heard about it. So we compared GridDB with Cassandra because many uh, database vendors have compared uh, their databases with Cassandra, or Cassandra is supposed to be the fastest uh, among the NoSQL databases. And this is what it looks like, GridDB throughput was four to five times higher. That's like 500% more uh, than that of Cassandra. That mainly is due to um, the in-memory capabilities as well as the algorithms in GridDB. And the latency was three to four times lower than that of Cassandra. On the right-hand side, and the tests were performed on the same uh, hardware conditions. It was run on uh, Microsoft Azure Cloud. Uh, you can. We have a white paper uh, on our GridDB.net website. Uh, please download it for more details. Uh, I've captured a couple of snapshots here. Uh, read latency uh, for 16 node cluster is uh, that looks like this. So we have in terms of uh, the latency is around less than 10 microseconds, whereas that of Cassandra is around 100 plus microseconds. And if you see on the bottom chart, you see throughput for a 16 node cluster and a 32 node cluster. So average throughput was around 200 to 300,000 uh, uh, operations per second. So these are done for various workloads. 
So YCSB Benchmark has uh, six different workloads, A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, so we performed it on these workloads. Uh, the workload E is not supported, so we don't have this on the chart. Yeah, but uh, please download that uh, white paper for more details. So, so why is GridDB faster? Uh, because of uh, two reasons, like I said, it's in-memory capabilities and the fixed schema. So you want to have a database that is not just uh, good for a short period of time, but you want to have superior stability. So when I ask superior stability, so it has to perform the same uh, when it's run for a long amount of time. Oh, by the way, th those two results were performed by a company called Fixstars. We wanted to be impartial, so they performed the test, and thanks to them. Um, they also performed a stability test across, uh, comparing GridDB and Cassandra for a uh, 24-hour time and the workload A was used. So these workloads are uh, like workload A may be read intensive, workload B is more write intensive, C is like half read, half upgrade, update, so those kinds. So you, we performed workload A, um, and there are other perform uh, tests as well. Uh, this chart shows GridDB perform consistent, consistently sorry, uh, in the 24-hour test and Cassandra's performance uh, dropped significantly. So uh, just a quick question, no polling here. If someone can answer why um, there is more variability uh, in GridDB and not in Cassandra, uh, maybe you can just email me or just uh, uh, leave a, drop a note here. Uh, that's a pretty interesting question here. And yeah, I would like to know your answers. Uh, I'll give you a hint, it's uh, think of um, in memory. So high availability is also one of the main factors which uh, is very much required uh, for any uh, database that is dealing with IoT use cases. So advanced master-slave model is what we call it uh, in, in internally for GridDB. So it's a hybrid cluster management uh, system where there is no single point of failure, even when the master node, so usually there are two things, right? So in a distributed computing, you have either master-slave or you have peer-to-peer. -peer. So we have something called as advanced master-slave, where when the master goes down, um, there is a buddy algorithm where the another node which is running uh, is elected as a master. So there is no single point of failure. And there is no problem of split brain. Split brain occurs in a distributed system where uh, there is a network partitioning uh, happening. So we have a quorum, quorum policy applied, so there is no split brain. Also, there is an autonomous data distribution. This is pretty important because, so whenever there is a failover or whenever a node goes down, um, so there, you have the original as well as replica. So let's say the replication factor is two. So your data is uh, stored in two different nodes uh, for failover conditions. So. When you add a new node, or when you take out the uh, node which is gone due to failure, due to system failure, which is pretty common, uh, data is automatically distributed, and this happens uh, instantly. Uh, when I say instantly, the process starts instantly, and it's uh, it's gradual process. So the data is de redistributed across all the existing nodes. If this happens even there is no failover, but you add an additional node to increase your capacity. Yep, so time series features. So, so the, the reason why I categorize GridDB in um, the IoT-related databases is because of these features. So high availability, high performance are pretty much needed, and most database vendors uh, claim they perform high, but you saw the results. But the, the main reason I would say it's made for IoT is due to these time series features. We have something called as TDPA, so the uh, time series data placement algorithms for high frequency data. Uh, this will maximize the memory utilization. So this is the main uh, main source, I would say, uh, that makes GridDB faster. So these the last four bullet points are pretty much important. Let's say expiry release function. So you have dumb sensors sending data every second or every 30 seconds, and you have 
you, you don't have much capacity to store all these. So you can always have those uh, data released after, like, say, 720 days. After two years, these, this data I don't require because I've gained all the insights what I gained from. So you can uh, um, let the data expire by itself after whatever amount of time you need. The aggregate functions, imagine if you don't have printf or like the multiplier functions whenever you start coding. Uh, if what, imagine what every developer had to write their own uh, routine for printf or any other functions. This is what most IoT developers suffer from. Um, if they want to have a minimum, maximum, average, or any aggregate function, uh, or any aggregate uh, data from the uh, time series or the previous uh, uh, already collected data, uh, GridDB provides all these functions. So you can just say, uh, I want minimum or the standard deviation of all the data from yesterday morning uh, to this morning, 10 a.m. So give me all that, and that's been, that can be done from uh, using the functions of GridDB. Then you have sampling and interpolation function. These are pretty much important. You know, you have a lot of sampling. Let's talk about sampling. You have a lot of data, and they are they come with time series. Uh, and there are prob there are uh, you have seen the IoT uh, data stack, right? If there is a problem with the connectivity layer, there might be a possibility that uh, data is missed. So you can interpolate that day missing data using the previous as well as the uh, next data. So interpolation function is given so that um, your application can make use of it. So sampling, let's say your uh, sensor is sending data every uh, once, uh, 10 seconds or so, but you want um, the average temperature of this room uh, every start of the hour, like 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 a, uh, noon. So give me that. So that's the sampling uh, function that we provide. You also have time next, time previous. Uh, please go through a quick start guide and the API reference. All are available on our website uh, to have a lot of uh, time series functions. Then we have trigger functions for notification, Java messaging service, and REST notification as well. So uh, the, this is the main interesting part I would want to cover. Uh, these are the real use cases. The first one is building energy management system, smart meters used by electric power company and the Smart City project. Uh, it's called Ishinomaki City in Japan that have used GridDB. So building energy management system. So there is a BEMS company uh, that is managing 100 plus buildings in Kawasaki, Japan. The company manages more than a petabyte of data, of sensor data every year. Um, so these are the calculations. Average five megabyte per data per sensor per day or approximately 2 GB per sensor. So if you do the math, it will come up to, um, so if you have like 100 to 1,000 sensor, depending on the size of the building or the square fit, uh, you have you are dealing with around 1 terabyte of data um, per building. So why was GridDB used here? Because it could scale easily, scale out, I would say. Uh, it's simple data model, no need for learning a lot of stuff and the time series queries and functions. So people love this because of this. So that is the first example. Then we have smart meters. So we have the electric power company. Um, it's one of the top, Japan's top uh, electric power companies. Uh, they were using a traditional relational database management system, and they switched just to check uh, to GridDB. And they saw a throughput by 2,000 times the old system, their legacy system. This way, they were uh, able to increase performance, and their data center costs were reduced significantly. So CIOs and people with uh, financial responsibilities would really love to use this. So why was GridDB used again here? Uh, because of its high performance, data handling, and reduced cost. So again, people don't want to spend a lot of time training their DBAs or engineers uh, if they can uh, completely like shift in uh, very less time. So smart meter example. So this was the example um, they gave the, from the previous example, the electric company that saved a lot of money. So this system has been running since April 2016, um, just uh, less than a year. Three million smart meters data is collected every 30 minutes. So you saw the data model example, which I used before, the smart meters. So each house or each smart meter is sending data every 30 minutes and is stored for three months. So data size we are talking about here is 
2.6 terabytes. And this is not millions of records, but there were 13 billion records. And you can imagine, but the size of each record was less than 200 bytes. So you see what we are dealing with here. So this is how our whole system looked like, or their system looked like. So we have all the 3 million smart meters, then we have meter data management system that collects data from all these. And data is input uh, in the three node cluster of GridDB and because of its fast performance. And once the data is stored, uh, the MapReduce jobs, so GridDB also comes with the MapReduce connector. So people who love Hadoop or talk about Hadoop, uh, they would love this. So MapReduce jobs, the, uh, the whole calculation, the balancing. So there were different operations performed by these electric companies. So 30 minute balance, so balancing took around 30 minutes. And <clears throat> then there was, that was sent to the power retailers and there was charge calculation, imbalance calculation. So these are all uh, power companies terms. There is demand generation and a uh, few other. So they calculate imbalance every, every 24 hours, I guess. So this was done in a five node cluster and they have the active RDB, the relational database. Uh, for their app, which they have already created, so they didn't want to uh, change that as well. So you can use GridDB for whatever needs you want. You can use GridDB along with other database systems as well. So it's not like you just remove your old legacy system and replace it with GridDB. So use it wherever GridDB uh, will be more efficient. So just like what the electric company had done. So smart city, the, it's a disaster tolerant Ishinomaki city. So Ishinomaki city was hit with the 2011 um, uh, tsunami and the city decided to have a community energy management system built. So that included all their city halls, schools, uh, some housing, temporary housing as well. So they had two or three systems. The main one was the building energy management system, uh, the one we spoke about earlier and there is home energy management system. So they all use GridDB. And the reason why they used was because of their, because of GridDB's uh, high speed processing or of large data and long term retention. So they wanted to keep uh, this data to analyze trends and they wanted to maintain consistency. So they didn't want, uh, so consistency like I told earlier, uh, it's one of the four asset properties, atomicity, consistency, isolation and durability. So this city uh, incorporated uh, this building energy management system and all other management systems and totally called it under a big umbrella called community energy management system. And GridDB is the core of the system. So uh, this is a bonus slide which we have uh, done recently uh, in the past couple of months. Um, this is not in use right now, but this is a proof of concept of a consignment charge calculation system. So uh, this is also from another um, electric power company in Japan, which is preparing for the 2020 uh, Tokyo Olympics. Uh, so they are expecting 30 million, uh, the projection is around 27 million smart meters by 2020 in uh, uh, their company. So we did this POC for 30 million smart meter data that again, collected every 30 minutes. I guess it's a pretty standard one for smart meters, I suppose. And it is stored for one month. So data size was uh, around 8.6 terabyte here. And you can see the picture here. So we used uh, regular uh, PCs uh, instead of uh, the VMs or the data center just for POC, right? Not uh, This won't be do the case in terms of production. So one month charge calculation system for all this 30 million meter data was executed in 96 minutes. So this is a pretty big feature. Earlier it used to take hours, like 24 hours or so. And this is what the, uh, it looks like, uh, the POC. Again, if you see here, it's like 43 billion records were analyzed. Again, the record size was less than 200 bytes. So 30 million smart meters, if you see the execution, the is, Loading 8.6 terabyte was did, was completed in less than two minutes. And this was performed on a six node GridDB cluster. And you can see how much uh, time it took for uh, each step. 
and MapReduce jobs were run on top of GridDB. So totally it took less than two hours, or I'll say close to one and a half hours. So we saw the use cases, we saw the features. Uh, let's talk about additions, or what type of additions GridDB provide, uh, languages and connectors uh, for developers who aren't, who aren't interested. So GridDB comes with uh, two flavors right now. Uh, the community edition, which is free, open source, uh, licensed under EGPL3. Um, there are a lot of uh, features uh, that are common for both the standard edition and uh, community edition. Um, then there is a standard edition, which is sold under commercial license. This comes with uh, software support. Uh, and online expansion, this is one uh, you don't get in the open source. Online expansion is like you, add, you keep adding nodes as your data increase online without stopping your system. But that's not the case uh, in the community edition. But you can, you're still free uh, to uh, play around with the community edition. Uh, it's open source, download the RPMs or build it from source code however you want uh, based on your interest. So you have online backup. So online get backup feature, you can uh, export or import data online. So most of the operational, uh, the DevOps guys, would appreciate this uh, with the standard edition. So, but for general audience, the engineers, developers, they can, they'll be happy to explore GitDB uh, using the community edition. So, GridDB runs on your data center, on-premise, uh, um, CentOS, Linux, I would say, but it, it also runs on private clouds or public clouds. Uh, it will run on AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure or Rackspace or any, any any cloud. If you have infrastructure and you want to install GridDB, that's pretty much straightforward. But GridDB is also available on Amazon AWS Marketplace. So you can, if you have some project already running on GridDB, so you can just uh, use the Community Edition uh, for free uh, and start exploring on AWS. Or you can use the Standard Edition and uh, explore. So GridDB uh, Community Edition is uh, free to use, and AWS charges are extra, though. So languages and connectors. So GridDB Community Edition is open source, like I said, and is available on GitHub. Uh, that's the link. Um, community uh, is free, so you can do whatever you want. Uh, we have a website called griddb.net. Uh, it's mainly for developers. So we have discussion forums, a lot of technical materials. Uh, so may please make use of it. Currently, uh, we support Java and C native interfaces. Uh, Python and Ruby will be released this month. Um, in the next phase, in the next two or three months, we have all these uh, language drivers um, for GridDB, like Go, PHP, Perl, and JavaScript. MapReduce connector is already available, and again, it's open source on GitHub. Mm, so some people who have already started, so Kairos DB uh, is another time series database, but it's the features are pretty limited. So you use Kairos DB along with another DB. So most uh, IoT developers, what we have seen, have already started their projects on uh, using Kairos DB because of the time series features. So you can use GridDB along with Kairos DB with the Kairos DB connector, which is again available on GitHub. Spark connector uh, for um, Spark users, people moving uh, or graduating from uh, the old MapReduce or Hadoop to Spark, they, it'll also be made available in the next release. Uh, and for BI, we have Grafana uh, and FluentD uh, connectors as well in, in the product pipeline. Yeah, to reiterate, uh, these are the features so IoT, uh, GridDB is custom designed for IoT, like I said. It's purpose built for IoT use cases. And it has a lot of time series operations, data types, uh, data types supported. Uh, then you have vector sites. Vector, vector edition of GridDB is, again, available internally. Um, we haven't released it outside, which will be done soon. So GridDB's hybrid composition of in-memory and disk is optimized, again, for maximum performance, like you saw before in terms of like 400 to 500 percent. So that's pretty huge. So you save a lot of uh, uh, expenses, I would say IT expenses. Horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling is another term for scale out. Uh, so we have tested for 
100 nodes per cluster, but ideally it, it should scale up to how, how many nodes per cluster you want. But when you design your system, uh, I think I don't I haven't seen anyone use more than or 80 or 80 90 nodes per cluster. You have multiple clusters, but uh, that's how you depends on how you design. Then you have autonomous data distribution uh, to prevent data loss, and that's uh, mainly for high availability. And then asset transactions are definitely guaranteed at the container level. And we have uh, TQL, which is a, a SQL-like query language. We, even though we don't support all the ANSI 92 SQL commands, we have uh, what is required. So let's quickly deep dive into a demo. Uh, I have a quick demo for this. I'll be sharing my screen. Um, this is. Uh, the demo that our developers created, it's, uh, it imitates or uh, simulates a windmill farm. And the idea is each windmill sends po its power generated every second to the GridDB server, and the same application is designed to query that data that is stored. Uh, the query is done every 20 seconds, and we do the aggregate functions. Like We use the aggregate functions to get the count, maximum, minimum, average. I just wanted to show uh, the time series capabilities here. So let me quickly share my screen. And yeah, feel free to ask any questions so that we'll be uh, spending last five minutes for Q&A. Mm -hmm. All right. I hope you guys can see my screen. Yeah, this is a windmill demo.java. This is written in Java. I just wanted to show here. Uh, so, windmill data, this is the schema. So, this is a row key annotation, and we have timestamp for recording time, and the power generated by each uh, wind. Um, I would say uh, wind fan or uh, wind blade, uh, how, how you define it. So um, when I start running uh, this, what I do is I create a timestamp, which is the current timestamp, and I generate a random number called mat.random, and I put it in a time series database. Uh, TS is the uh, time series container, the uh, time series container which we have created. And we create, depending on the number of, uh, it's a dual loop, if you see the number of clients. Yeah, so this application can handle as many number of clients. It spawns different threads for uh, different uh, number of clients. So these are pretty simple. Once the data is stored in the time series, uh, data store. Uh, these are the TQL uh, queries. Select count. So you want to see the count, how many how many uh, records were there from where this time to this time. So two EPO MS is um, that's a time stamp conversion for um, the programming reasons. So this is the count. Then there is maximum of the data that the power MW is the uh, integer uh, which we created in our schema. Maximum from this time to this time, again, you have minimum, you have average, you have sum. Uh, there are a lot of time series other uh, operations which we can see. All right, let's uh, see how it runs. So this is a quick demo. Let's see if the GridDB is running. No, GridDB server is not running. So I'll start the node. Uh, so there are two uh, configuration files, one for each node and one for cluster. Uh, since I have only one VM running, and we are running a one node cluster. So I say GS start node, which just starts the node. So if you see uh, PID 6154-6156 are the GridDB servers uh, running. So once the node is uh, started running, you just say, um, join cluster. Since even it's a one node cluster, uh, we still do it. So cluster name is SC2. I'm using the standard edition. And username with password, admin name and password. So we have joined the cluster. If you want to see uh, the, all right, sorry, the nodes joined in the cluster. 
you can use GS tag and you can see here yeah so there is one master um, and there is active count is one there is only one node and this is the address of the node and the port of the node so once we have this uh, let's run our uh, uh, Java we'll compile that Java file windmills demo dot Java yep okay it's run uh, let's run our program so the program is written in such a way um, one thread keeps appending the data to the time series container the other one queries it so let's run this for uh, that's the uh, uh, node address port address cluster name ID and password so I'll just say one uh, one uh, sensor is sending the data and I say A is for append it's uh, programmatically written so the appending has started so if you see uh, timestamp Wednesday May 3rd uh, 1052 uh, you have 89 these are the random numbers generated so the number is generated every one second that's the interval so it's on a loop so it keeps adding on the other hand let's query the data so this is the command for querying. I do, instead of A, I, at the last I say Q. So this command queries the data that is stored here. It's the same program, so I don't have to recompile it. So if you see uh, on Wednesday, May 30th, that's the start time, the end time. The count is 20. Maximum of was 80, 88, and minimum was 1. Average was 44. The total sum of all the 20. Uh, data was uh, 886 so that's how so this is also on loop but this goes on every 20 seconds so that's the interval so this is pretty much simple um, nothing much apart from this uh, that's the demo uh, we have like five or four more minutes left let's quickly go for Q&A let's see how much uh, questions I have I have a few questions uh, yeah please feel free to ask questions and before that these are some of the useful links um, that's the developers website griddb.net so you have discussion forums you have Q&A FAQs a lot of documents then you have Toshiba griddb website uh, for the commercial software uh, you have Git TV, uh, sorry griddb github repository so these three, uh, there are so many documents, but I would suggest these three, take a look at these three documents, especially the technical reference, gives you uh, the overall picture of uh, what GridDB is. And then there is API reference uh, for a list of APIs that are supported. And quick start for quickly starting your uh, first GridDB cluster. All right, let's see uh, what I have. And just give me a couple of minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, one person has asked he couldn't read any of the screen shared. I'm sorry about that, but um, yeah, we have uh, all those things uh, available on our website. And then there is, so what's the difference between community and standard edition? How much is the cost for GridDB? Can GridDB be used on AWS? Yeah, like I said, um, the the previous slide so this webinar is available on demand so you can go back uh, refer it refer my slides uh, or hear it so if you go back to the previous slides we have uh, the community edition and standard edition differences the only main difference i would say is the online expansion like if you're without stopping your cluster and the support which we provide along with the uh, other uh, language drivers so that's that that's what comes with uh, standard edition and the pricing is available for a and it's available on AWS marketplace so you can uh, use directly from the AWS marketplace it's also available for docker as well so you can create a docker image if you are uh, familiar with docker and how much does it cost so the pricing is on AWS uh, and you should, please contact me for uh, the pricing um, in case you want to use the uh, grid DB standardization on your uh, servers or your data center
So what are these workloads that are being referred to? So the YCSB workloads, uh, there are six different types of workloads, workload A, B, C, D, till F. So it's something like workload A, I'm not sure which one's which. Uh, workload B is 95% read and 5% write. So this is a standard benchmark created by Yahoo, I, I guess, uh, back in 2010. And since, like you have TPCH, TPCC for comparing uh, performances of uh, RDBMS, uh, there is no single benchmark for comparing NoSQL database. So this is the closest one. Yahoo Cloud Servicing Benchmark was the closest one. Please take a look at it. Um, uh, we have a whole white paper on it. So there is a long question. I don't want to read it. Uh, so where does the database live? Is it in the IoT, uh, gateway IoT devices? No, this is not an embedded uh, database. This is uh, this, the database lives on wherever you install on the servers, mainly in the data centers or on the cloud. So we don't have any embedded version uh, to run this database on the devices uh, as of now. <clears throat> and the next question, is it available on Azure? Yeah, you can install this on any cloud system, but it's not available on Azure Marketplace. So when I say that, so if you have Azure instance, you can uh, use GridDB RPMs, or uh, you can build the code on uh, from the source code itself. You can install them on uh, Azure Cloud. So, but it's not currently available on the marketplace, uh, and we are planning to do that soon. Can I use multiple DBs at once with GridDB for time series operation? Yeah, definitely. Like I showed in previous example. Uh, many people use a mixture of databases in their whole uh, enterprise systems. So use GridDB wherever you think is uh, definitely applicable. I would say, uh, so one company try, evaluated GridDB recently, very recently, and they used GridDB, uh, are planning to use GridDB for their employee log management. So that's a pretty interesting scenario, right? So you have employees come in and go out uh, from particular doors or particular location. So you, they wanted to keep logs of all those uh, people. So they use GridDB and they could do it in very few number of nodes. So that's one use case. So you can, and that's not the only database that enterprises, the enterprise used. So let's see, there is one more big question. I'll answer it later. <laughs> so replication, how can it, how, how can that be changed? So what type of replication? So replication, so, we have two configuration files, like I said in the demo, um, js.node.2json file, files, one for each node and one for cluster. So you can uh, create uh, or set the replication factor. So replication factor of one is like no replication at all. Your data is just stored once. Two or three uh, is the number of uh, how many times your data should be replicated across uh, different nodes. That's the uh, question on replication. And what type of consistency levels do you offer? Um, currently, we offer uh, immediate consistency and eventual consistency. So eventual consistency uh, is faster because that gives that makes your whole system highly available. Even though you don't want uh, to, you, you, you can give up uh, consistency for eventual consistency and for higher performance. But we do offer immediate consistency as well. How is the data stored from memory to disk? Oh, we have something called as a checkpoint uh, system. So we have checkpoints. So you can create a checkpoint interval, uh, like say every 30 seconds or every one minute. So memory is flushed onto device, devices uh, within that time frame. Or it's not, not devices, pardon me. Uh, onto the disk, it can be either SSD or HDD. So that we have checkpoint and file system. All right, we are uh, one minute uh, to the ending. Uh, I'll try to answer as many questions as possible offline. Uh, thanks again. Uh, I really appreciate all of you joining today with me. Uh, please download and give it a try. You have my contact. Uh, please feel free to contact me or uh, if you have any questions uh, when you're stuck, please go to the discussion forum on griddb.net. Um, we can try to, we'll try to answer it as soon as possible. Thanks a lot again. Have a wonderful day, guys. Thank you very much.